comes now. Uh, this is this is addition. It's not subtraction. So we appreciate him. Before we go to the word of the Lord, I know I'm talking a long time. Uh, one more piece of news and information. Where where are John and Emily Warren, St. Junior, not Senior. John and Emily are going to have a baby, and so we're uh, happy for them. We're going to start praying right now that this child looks like her and acts like her. But no, we're, we're happy for them. And I want to say the, the best part of what I do is getting a front row seat to watch God work in the lives of, of people. And we pick on them a lot, and that's not going to change. But the amount of growth and change in the Lord in John Warren's life in these last five years, stuff like that's why I get up in the morning. We love them and appreciate them. Happy for them. Amen. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. The word of the Lord says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. If we can skip down to verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. We're going to talk about the coming of the Lord soon. The Bible has a lot to say about the build up to that. And so much of it's already happening. And before you get too excited or upset, I want to tell you there's a lot more that's about to happen. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Notice verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He said, I'm the beginning and the end, which is, which was, and which is to come. Stephen Hicks had no idea what I was preaching this morning, but I knew when he opened his mouth that the Lord was about to help somebody. Which is, which was, and which is to come. I want to talk to us today about right now. Right now. The Bible said we're not wise if we spend our days pining away for the good old days. They ain't coming back. And it's a dreadful mistake to live our whole life thinking about tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. The Lord that we're here to interact with, to get to know better. It's not just a history lesson. Nor is it merely a prophetic work that is to come. I want to focus our attention on the day we're living in, this one. The moment we're occupying, this one. And what God can and will do for us right now. Now, let's ask Him to help us. Lord, we love You. We thank You so much for all Your blessings, Your kindness. Lord, Your wondrous works in our midst. And I pray right now that Your anointing would be in this room, in this building, on the hearts and minds of everyone listening to us online or in the sanctuary today. And we pray, God, that Your Spirit would just continue to work in our midst, that we could be more like You when we leave this building than we are right now. We're believing You, God, to do what we could never do for ourselves or by ourselves have your way in this place we pray in Jesus name amen can we just obey the book of Psalms and clap our hands unto the Lord one more time hallelujah amen amen you may be seated the timelessness of God is something that uh, comes up in conversation typically with our children the moment they begin to try to wrap their mind around it. And none of my children could do that when they were small. And if I could confess, I have a pretty difficult time doing that now that I'm not so small anymore. 
It's something that's too vast for our mortal mind to fully grasp. Eternity is a word that's easy to use, but it's so difficult to define and almost impossible to fully comprehend. If you really want to make your mind sweat, go back to that same conversation that my kids had when they were three and four years old and try to get a hold of the fact, just the mere idea that God had no beginning. A trillion in years before there were years when there were no angels he was already there and he was already self-sustaining and self-existent uh, inhabiting eternity the psalmist said it like this before the mountains were brought forth uh, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God then he went on to say of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands they shall perish but thou shalt endure yea all of them shall wax old as doth a garment as a vesture thou shalt change them and they shall be changed but thou art the same thy years have no end for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity he wanted us to understand that the God that we worship and serve but so far beyond that the God that we interact with he has an address in eternity his existence really 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 does have no beginning and time to him has no meaning he doesn't operate off of a calendar and he doesn't wear a watch some of you don't either and you don't operate off time but that's an entirely different conversation those things exist for our benefit. He doesn't need them, but we need them. He exists outside of the boundaries of everything that exists that is temporal. From everlasting past until time immortal and eternal, in the future He reigns sovereign. Now I know you understand it, but give me a second. In all of that time, He is God and God alone. He repeated over and over again for Old Testament Israel real to understand there's no one like him there's no one beside him there's no one before him there's no one after him he said I look around and behold I cannot find another he's not just sovereign he's mighty and he is almighty and, and he's worthy of our very best but I will confess that that kind of vastness even though I absolutely believe it still after all the these years it can be overwhelming to me we understand that he's majestic and that he's wonderful and that he's powerful my goodness I was talking to a, uh, a minister of uh, another stripe and uh, uh, from a very uh, church much like I grew up in very traditional and a very ritualistic and, and, uh, he, and uh, people I respect greatly because can you understand what it must take to serve the Lord like some of those sweet people serve the Lord without the experience that we've experienced and he confessed to me I believe in the Bible and I said well I assumed that when you told me you were a pastor he said can I tell you something he said I've never seen a real undeniable medical or scientific instantaneous miracle he said I don't doubt the word of the Lord at all but I've never seen one and I leaned in and I said we should hang out more because if you hang around our place you'll find out that that's not just something that he did then he is ever the same you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you that's not something that he used to do it's something that he does now but he's not just powerful he's transcendent and it's sometimes that's difficult for you and I to relate to for me to relate to it's staggering almost incomprehensible that he sees every bird that falls from the sky that the God who holds the universe in place by his upholding power the Bible says ensures that the earth hangs in er orbit it hangs upon nothing and that every planet revolves around its sun in the proper number of days that that God knows the very number of hairs all 
on your head. I know that it's true academically. I understand it academically. But the reality leaves me scratching my head. It also leaves me rejoicing because I know that He's the God of all time. Not just ages past and eons to come. But He's the God of all time. His yesterdays bless me. And His tomorrow promises bless me. But He's not just the God of yesterday. And He's not just the God of tomorrow. He's got it in His hand right now too. So stick with me a second. I rejoice today that I understand He is the God which was. The Bible said He is my testimony. I'm glad that I have a track record with Him. If you just decide to start serving Him this morning, you've made the best decision of your life, and I rejoice in that with you. But you listen to me. You Sometimes when you go through it the first time, you have to try to figure out, is He able and is He willing and is He this and is He that? I'm not wringing my hands worried about elections or pandemics or economies or doctor's reports because I know what He He's done for me through these last years. I know who He is. I've got confidence in Him today because of what I've walked through yesterday. I can trust Him with tomorrow because of what I've lived through with Him yesterday. He is the God which was. He has a track record and that gives me confidence. I've lived through enough valleys to know that He's going to get me to the next mountain. I know He'll supply my need because He has. I know He can help me navigate my adversaries because He has. I know He can heal my body because He has. I know He can carry my load because He has. I know that He can move mountains because He has. See, if we could ever grasp, He doesn't change. What He did yesterday, He'll do that today. And what He was last month and last year, that's who He is right now. He's the God who was. I I love our children. I love our youth and our young adults. And I thank God for the vibrancy that we have here uh, in Longview First Church. But I once was uh, preaching an event and I heard an 11-year-old girl with a big booming voice singing, He's been faithful, faithful to me. And she did great and it was sweet. But I kind of chuckled because she doesn't even know what she's singing he has been faithful to her but she doesn't understand that yet not really but the farther I go the truer it rings and if I could give every child of God who served him one thing it would be a memory because isn't it funny how we're in the midst of a struggle and a crisis it's so difficult to flip that calendar back and remember where we were and what he did we just don't hold on to the best part of yesterday's I can live my tomorrow in faith because I know where he was yesterday and where he brought me from yesterday and whatever might be waiting on us in January of 2021 or 2022 or 2023 I know who I used to be and I know what he did and the Bible said we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony The God who was ought to be enough to carry you forward if you've lived through what we have. And and, and so what when panic and troubles come? I've never, if I'd never had to trust Him before, I could understand it. But we have no excuse who've walked with Him this far. If He was an unproven commodity, then it would make sense. If He had never worked a miracle for me, we do this every now and then. And I know we're missing all kinds of people. How many of you have ever received an instantaneous physical miracle? Anybody? Will you raise your hands? I want you to look around here today because when you're at rock bottom and don't have any idea what's coming next or how you're going to get through it you know what I do I don't just quote scripture and I do and I don't just remember biblical healings and I do but I remember things we've seen him do in this building and in our old location and things I've seen him do in preaches, churches I preached about and around and in prayer meetings all the way back to the moment he filled me with the Holy Ghost I cannot fret and remember at the same time now every spring and every fall you hear the same radio ads telling you how to become a zillionaire if you listen to talk radio or sports radio every spring 
at every fall. Buy gasoline in the futures market. You can take $5,000 and control like half of the world's oil supply in the fall. Purchase oil. It's gone up every winter for the last 130 years. And you're going to have more money than Bill Gates by Christmas if you'll just listen to us right now. And I always wonder if it works so good, why are you paying for commercials? You should be buying oil. But at the end of the advertisement, there's always a lawyer. And not just a lawyer, a fast-talking lawyer. Who comes on and buried in the middle of a disclaimer that's about that law. There's always that one statement. Past performance is not indicative or doesn't guarantee future results. Even though it's done this every year since 1742, that doesn't mean that it's going to do it this year. Even though it's done it every year since the internet's been in existence, that doesn't mean that it's going to do it this year. I'm glad I'm a preacher today and not an advertising agent because I don't have to run any disclaimers. I can tell you that what he did for Cheryl Moore, I can tell you that what he did for Penny Blake, I can tell you that what I watched him do in my life, he'll absolutely positively do that in yours because he said, I am the Lord, I change not. He is no respecter of persons. He is Jesus Christ. Christ the same yesterday forever but also today if he was a healer he is a healer if he was a provider he is a provider if he was a deliverer he is a deliverer if he was a savior he is a savior if he was a comforter he is a comforter he's the God which was see some people get that in their bones And it changes them. Some sing it and believe it and quote it, but they never grasp it. And when you flip through the pages of this book, there's a difference in the people that get it and the people that say it. David, what makes you think, you ruddy little snot box? Not old enough to vote. He might could have voted this year, but not old enough to vote. That you could just waddle on out into a valley and kill a 13 foot tall giant who's been a soldier as long as you've been alive. David didn't talk about David. David didn't talk about training. David didn't talk about himself at all. He did say there was a lion and there was a bear. And God is able to make this uncircumcised Philistine like one of them. He remembered when I was alone and a boy and the lion came into the flock. When I was a boy alone and the bear came into the flock. And now that I'm a young man alone, the enemy might be different. But the God of my help is the same. If we could ever get it. You've heard me say this a hundred times. But we quote the 23rd Psalm. We quote it at funerals. We quote it in difficult days. We print it on the back of handouts at memorial services. But David understood what he was writing. Back then, every shepherd carried a staff. They still do. And then they had the family staff that was an heirloom. You didn't just throw that around all the time. But traditionally to this day in the Middle East... When a shepherd boy spent his first night by himself in the wild with the sheep, he would carry the family staff. The staff that dad didn't drop and run back to grandma with when he was a scared boy. The staff that grandpa carried out here maybe to this same spot on a cold night. And great grandpa never knew him, but he didn't run. How am I going to take this home and face them in the morning? And every time a shepherd killed a predator in defense of the flock that he kept, he'd put a notch in that staff. And it was there as a record. It was a trophy. But it was also a great reminder. When you hear the wolf howl, and I've had wolves before. And when the mountain lion's at a distance, you know, I've had mountain lions before. 
And when David stood before Saul, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Never made it about me. He leads me beside still waters. I couldn't find him if I had to, but he restores my soul. He said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God, the track record of what you've done. I've never fought a giant, but you fought the first one. I've never handled a bear, but that's nothing new for you. You know what you're doing. If a preacher friend, a lady called him, and uh, they asked, she asked if she could reserve their fellowship hall because her fifth anniversary of being cancer free was coming up in a few months and she wanted to have a, a get together for her family and friends just to celebrate and, and he was overwhelmed and happy and they, they remember the journey God brought her through hers was a medical miracle and then she called back a few days later she said pastor uh, I don't know how to tell you this but my cancer's back and they're doing tests today would you, would you help me pray and a week or so later she called him and said oh pastor I've got great news he said let me hear it she said I've got the exact same kind of cancer I had before he said I don't think we have the same definition of great news she said no that's good news I was afraid it'd be something new I was afraid I'd have to figure it out all over again but I remember when they gave me months to live and I remember that service when everybody prayed for me and God didn't just touch me God healed me if it was something different I'd have to scrape up faith to go through it but I know he can handle this because he already had I can thank God for Bible stories for Gideon's and for Paul's and for the widow's oil but I get my strength when I remember what he's done for the widow women in this room what we saw him do what we heard him do what we felt him do I know he's a healer not because he healed Naaman but because he healed me I know he's a helper I know he's a provider not because he fed Elijah but because he fed me I know he's a savior not because of Acts chapter 10 but because of what he did for me so every now and then When it's tough, when it's hard, when we're grinding it out. Every now and then, I hope he's watching at home right now. The whole poor Faulkner family lost his mom since he's been at this church. Got COVID and pneumonia and nim COVID. Then she did. They're trading out hospitals. A couple of other things happened. Then poor, poor Grace on Thanksgiving Day, her appendix was about to rupture. And so from the table to, to the hospital, all night in surgery, he took McKenzie to the hospital last night. Laid there like 117 hours. That's an exaggeration. Felt like it though. Problem after problem after problem after problem. People go through that. Y'all may not know this, but we've had an extraordinarily difficult year. You probably haven't, but the rest of us have. It's been odd. I told you a few weeks ago, I've spent my whole life trying to avoid negative people. Now I'm trying to avoid positive people. The whole world's upside down. It's crazy. It's crazy. But every now and then, you need to step back and ask yourself a question. Has he ever answered one prayer for you? Has he ever answered one prayer for you? Honey, if he's answered one, he can answer two. And after two, he can answer three. He is the God which was. Now I'm hurrying. He's not only the God which was. He's the God which is to come. He's not just my history and my testimony. He's my expectation. When it comes to walking with Jesus, I don't just look back. I look forward. And I look forward to what God is going to do. I have an expectation because of Him. I don't spend my days looking forward to valleys or to scurry. Oh, but Brother Moore, it's going to be so bad. Do you have any idea how horrible the world is about to be? I preached for a friend the other day whose dad... uh, 
is a missionary, an exceptional one. And, and this particular uh, uh, preacher has just, just built a phenomenal revival church and uh, have always enjoyed spending time with them. And, and, and we, go, we go way back and he was talking about political elections and there was one years and years ago and he remembers his dad walking in with tears in his eyes because of the result, the whole world's over, country's gone, we're never going to recover from that. And then eight years later, everything's wonderful, and, and it's going to be fine now. And, and then eight years later, the country's gone, and it's terrible, and we're never going to recover from that. And then eight years later, thank God, we've just got the... I want to tell you something. I, I have an opinion just like you do. I'm opinionated and invested. I care about the country because my kids live in it. It matters to me. But if your entire hope and outlook is tied to the direction this worldly ship is selling, you're going to be a miserable person. A miserable person. I don't spend my days looking forward to valleys. The Bible told us what's going to happen, and you're not going to like most of it. But in the midst of that, there is going to be a revival like we have not seen and that's where my focus is but there are people who spend their life looking for the problem it's what they do they're like food critics let me figure out what's wrong with this dish there are people who are just gifted at finding the cloud in every silver lining and my friend if that's you I love you and I'm praying for you. We're probably not having lunch. But I love you. When I look forward, I don't just see problems. I see Jesus. And opportunities. Challenges, yeah. But opportunities. He is the author. Notice what he said. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. See, he's not just the God which was. He's the God which is to come. I've said this before. And uh, somewhere in this big old building and all these rooms, we're going to start a class for negative people. The lock's going to be on the outside of the door, but we're going to start a class for them. And find somebody who can cook like sour cookies. We love them all. We appreciate them all. That's not the group I want to be a part of. Because my expectations are not in our country. Or its economy. Or its leaders. Or in my abilities. Or in my plans. They have to be in the God which is to come. Oh but brother Moore. Surely you're a realist. I am. But it starts with this. God is real. And there are going to be problems. And the world's headed off a cliff. And at some point our country's going to go with it. But I've noticed something. Joseph's dreams. He saw sheaves bowing. He saw the sun and the stars and the moon bowing down. I can't find anywhere in his dream Potiphar's wife lying and accusing him of rape. God forbid if somebody falsely accuses you. The Bible gave you the pamphlet on how to handle that. I can't find him being betrayed by his brethren and thrown into a pit anywhere. I can't find him being sold into slavery anywhere. I can't find him being forgotten and neglected in prison anywhere. Because when God gives you a dream, he shows you the destination, not the path that you might have to follow to get there. And our trust is not in the path. Our trust is in the destination. Our trust is not in the journey our trust is in the destination our trust is not in the process it is in the processor so when it's my turn to be in the pit I know he hasn't lost me he knows right where I am the God which is to come my soul David said wait thou only on God we're not waiting on revival we're waiting on God we're not waiting to catch a break. We're waiting on God. I'm not waiting on some problem. I'm waiting on God. My expectation is in Him. But we got to hurry. We've got to seek to understand, relate to, and know Jesus Christ. Our hunger has to be for Him. See, some people miss it. We interact with people every day that care nothing about us. We're just their next paying customer. And you interact with people that you care little about. But they provide you a service. We can't ever fall into the trap 
of treating Jesus like a customer or merely becoming a customer of His. He's not the mechanic. If He can fix it, that's all I need to know. It's so much deeper than that. Our hunger cannot be for His hand. It has to be for His face. That I may know Him. That I may know Him. In Revelation chapter 1, as Jesus identifies Himself to John, He seems to have a chronology problem. We would say He's the God which was, the God which is, and the God which is to come. But that's not what Jesus said. In verse 8, He said He's the God which is, which was, and which is to come. Before He is my testimony, or before He is my expectation, He is my reality. He's in the middle of it with me right now. Now, before he's yesterday and before he's tomorrow, he is right now. I've seen God heal people of AIDS, cancer, blindness. We've seen him open death and ears, and I rejoice in all that. And we believe what the Bible says, that one day the trump of God's going to sound, and whether I'm in my grave or standing right here, I'm going to be changed and transformed and be caught up with him to meet him in the air. And I rejoice at that. But don't you ever miss this for one second. There's nothing that he's ever done or that he's ever going to do that he can't do right here and right now. He is the God which is. Lord, help us. I don't want to raise grandchildren that listen to me tell stories of what happened in the late 90s. In the early 2000s. And in our old building. You know, back when the Lord was in his prime, before his hair turned gray and he slowed down. We can't ever lose the reality. If you need a miracle in your life, you can have it right here and right now. If you need deliverance in your body or your mind, you can have it right here and right now. If you need a miracle in your family, you can have it right here and right now. He is the God which is. Matter of fact, anybody besides me got something you need God to do? Think about it. Don't rush. Don't waste it. Something that you can't do or you already would have. But you need God to do that. Let's stand together. We're going to do something. Whoever's playing, come play something. He is the God which is. What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them which is Jesus Christ has never been more powerful than he is right now and he's never going to be more powerful than he is right now remember the most majestic miracle you've ever seen saw a shortened limb grow maybe the long one shrank I don't know but both of her Legs were the same length. I'll never forget that. Sweet Mary Alford, losing her eyesight. Couldn't see anymore, losing her license, losing her job. In one prayer meeting, gone. She can still see. It's Brian Gibbs' mom that preaches here. I'll never forget that. I could go on all day long. But when I think about the miracle working power of God, You hear me tell stories about my kids because they're here and you know them. And I'll never cease to thank God for it. When I was a 17-year-old boy, they brought a lady into a church in northeast Mississippi who was about to die of the AIDS virus. You've heard me tell the story, some of you. God she was at the end. God healed that woman when he filled her with the Holy Ghost. She gained 40 some odd pounds. Quick. Now I can do that, but it's not a miracle. <laughs> she was back in her pre-diagnosed, I mean like that. And before that revival was over, we baptized her doctor because he was sold. And her nurse and his receptionist. <laughs> 
and the doctor's wife and the doctor's daughter and it started a chain reaction and every time I find myself in a corner and I know this is going to take a miracle when I close my eyes and start praying I go back to her God I've seen you do miracles before and if you can heal that woman of the AIDS virus and fill her back out to a normal I know, I know, I know that you can touch me right here and see I'm glad he's the God of yesterday but I don't live in yesterday and I'm glad he's the God of tomorrow but I don't live in tomorrow he is the God of today right here and right now he's not just the God of what's to come and he's not just Lord of what used to be he's the God of right now So I wonder if we could open our mind and our heart. What would you ask God for? If you could peel through the carnality and the doubt and the self-loathing and the guilt and make this about Him and not you, what would you ask God to do if you were sure He'd do it today? If you were sure he do it today. I know what time it is. But I have a right now need for the God which is. He is a present help in the time of trouble. He said the day we seek Him with our whole heart, He will be found of us. I wonder right now, if you've got a right now need, would you just bring it to Him? Would you bring it up here with with us right now. Come on, let's reach out together. My goodness, we've seen God touch Gary. God's blessed Gary. I remember when they were never going to let him work again. He's got a full-time job. Told his mama he'd never be 20. Here he is 20 several times over. That's the kind of God that we serve. You've heard me talk about my oldest son, Daniel. He was a tumor pregnancy. They told us we couldn't carry him. We went to church and prayed. The pain went away. God moved 